praise God. The Easter is one of the fundamental basic foundations of all valid Christian theology is the goodness of God. He doesn't always leap through our hoops. He doesn't jump across our barrels. He may not run it the way you want, but no matter what, no matter what happens in your own personal history or in the history of this world that we live in, God remains good. Go on and praise Him for it. Magnify the Lord in the house. Praise His holy name. Now, before you're seated, before you're seated, you know we live in a discouraging world, don't we? Uh, anybody else just ever get to the place where you don't want to turn the news on? But I believe in the ministry of encouragement. So we're going to all take part in it today. When, in just a moment, I want you to turn to the, someone near you, not your spouse. Turn to someone near you, look them right in the eye and say, cheer up, friend. You're probably not as bad as your in-laws think. Well, I'm Mark Rutland, and I'm absolutely delighted to be back at Free Chapel. I tell you. Met some lady this morning, and she said, you know, I, I came here to hear Jensen Franklin preach. I said, ma'am, I am Jensen Franklin. I just had a really bad week. <laughs> well, I'm delighted to be back here. I always miss your faces. I want us to take just a moment and welcome the other parts of this congregation. We are one church in multiple locations. These are not distance. They are us in distant places. First of all, let's greet our online campus. Will you do that? And then all the other campuses, Orange County, Gwinnett, Spartanburg, Midtown, Cumming, and Brazelton. Let's welcome them all. We are, we are you and you are us. In just a moment, I'm going to be reading a passage of scripture from Acts chapter 8. While you're turning there, I, uh, I preached uh, last week in another state uh, uh, graduation service. And as I came out, one of the young people said, man, that was dope. So I was walking with a young guy, a young minister there, and I, as we walked on, I said, I think that kid said that was dopey. And he said, no, no, Dr. Earl. And he said that was dopey. He said, that means great. It was really good. It was dope. And I said, oh, like cocaine. Then, <laughs> dope, you, you get addicted to it. You, you can't get enough of it. You got to have it. You got to have it. He said, okay, yeah. So it brought to mind all kinds of images. And I could just see some dark street corner where there's a guy there with a little table and a black box and a fancy car pulls up and rolls the window down and says, do you have any dope? He says, yes. I got Mark Rutland CDs. <laughs> and if you want the really good stuff, Jensen Franklin. I've got some Charles Stanley pills. And the guy said, what about downers? Do you have any downers? Oh yeah, I've got John MacArthur. <laughs> After a while, people don't even listen to the CDs anymore. They grind them up and line them up on the... <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, this is going to be dope. If you tell anybody I said that, I'm going to deny it and claim that you have a demon. All right. If you have your Bibles, if you'll take those and turn to Acts chapter 8. Let me give you the backstory so the text itself will make sense. By Acts chapter 8, the first wave of persecution has hit the church in Jerusalem. Remember the, the church, we talk about the, the church worldwide we're only talking about a few thousand Jewish believers in one city, at least in one country, but mostly in one city, Jerusalem. And the first wave of persecution hits them and they begin to be scattered just to get out. The persecution also hits in Jerusalem. So one of the leaders of the church, a man named Philip, uh, he is often called Philip the Evangelist. 
But he was not ordained as Philip the Evangelist. He was ordained as a steward, as a deacon, if you will. So Philip is driven from Jerusalem to Samaria. And at Samaria, there he preaches and he has a great revival. It says, and all the people with one accord gave heed to those things which Philip preached, seeing the signs and wonders that he did. And they believed. And there is this mass water baptism. Basically, the whole town is water baptized. And then the apostolic leadership that is, please take note, still at Jerusalem. The apostolic leadership hears what has happened. And this, this is where we begin. Acts chapter 8, 14 through 17. And when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, only they were living as men and women baptized in the name of Jesus. In other words, water baptism. They had had an evangelical experience. Now they wanted them to have a Pentecostal experience. And when Peter and John laid hands on them, there, then and there they received the Holy Ghost. Now skip down to verse 25 and 26. And when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they, meaning the apostles, Peter and John, they returned to Jerusalem. I just want you to take note of that. They just went back to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many of the villages of the Samaritans. But the angel of the Lord spoke unto Philip saying, arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Put your hands on your Bible, if you will, and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, with our hands upon the word and our hearts and minds as open as we know how to get them, we're asking you to do all the rest. Brush aside every barrier to divine communication. Rush in over the threshold of our souls. Deal with us in the inner person that when we leave here today, we will say one to another, surely the Lord has spoken unto us. In the mighty name, Jesus, the strong son of God, amen. The, uh, the first 10 chapters of the book of Acts could be subtitled, God trying to get the early church to obey. The last thing, think among the very last things that Jesus says before he leaves the earth, is taken up into heaven to be at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. What is one of the last things he says to the church? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's just so simple. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And the apostles, it's like a, a Monty Python skit. They say, we hear exactly what you're saying. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And we know exactly what that means. Stay here in Jerusalem and don't talk to anybody that isn't Jewish. Sometimes I think that, it, that God knows how we, that we make God feel like we do with our teenagers. Go clean up your room. Do you understand English? Go clean up your room. Yes, I understand you perfectly. Lie here on the couch until it's after dark and then leave with my friends. The whole, the whole concept of the first 10 chapters of Acts is that the church at Jerusalem is feeling this tension to stay where they are and this sense of tension go you into all the world. But what finally causes them to leave Jerusalem? Where are they meeting? In the temple. Not just in Jerusalem, in the temple, they are still clinging to the historical and experiential theological foundations of their Jewish faith. And they're still in the temple on Solomon's porch, the porch that runs, the portico that runs along the side of the outer, of the outer courtyard. And they're, so when they have church, they're having church in the temple, in Jerusalem, on the porch. And God is saying, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That tension exists in the first 10 chapters. What finally, God does everything in the world, signs, wonders, vision, Simon Peter's vision of the, on the rooftop in, in Jaffa, all of those things. But what finally drives them out of Jerusalem is actually persecution. When I was a kid, I, I live in the United States now, I live here in Georgia and I love it. I live in the United States, but I was actually not born in the United States. I was born in the Republic of Texas and... <laughs> 
it's rude to laugh at me. And um, my grandfather owned a small ranch in East Texas. A, a ranch is a little bit of an ostentatious title. It was just a, a large cattle farm. And he had a small house there with a little mm, concrete front porch. Not, not a veranda like you have on a southern Gothic mansion. Just a little concrete porch. And in the evenings, the old people would get on that porch and to get out from under the blazing East Texas sun, they would, in the cool of the evening, they'd drink iced coffee. And all of us kids, you know, little tykes, we would play around. And I can remember driving my tricycle up and down on, and I can hear, to this day, I can hear my grandfather's voice saying, I've got hundreds of acres here. Get off the porch. Have you ever noticed how your children want to, play, little children especially, want to play right around your feet? And you just, just once get on a really important phone call and perfectly normal children will go demon possessed. I can hear my grandfather saying, get off the porch, get off the porch. And his volume, the intensity would rise. We usually had it pretty well measured. And we knew when to jump off. Because my grandfather kept a broom that he leaned up behind the rocking chairs against. And when we'd see that big old hand reach for that broom, we'd start trying to dive off the porch. We usually made it, but sometimes we didn't. My grandfather would grab that broom and whichever kid was nearest, he'd just pop you base over apex out into the front yard. And I can still remember him standing there saying, now get off the porch. You could actually subtitle the first 10 chapters of the book of Acts, get off the porch. And what I want to do, I want to obey God before he uses whatever means is necessary to drive me off of the porch. I don't want to disobey him reluctantly up to the place where he has to unleash the dogs of persecution to drive me out into the world. Now, why won't we obey God? Why didn't the early apostolic community, why, why didn't they do what they were told in the very beginning, go ye into all the world? Why were they still in Jerusalem, in the temple, on the porch, 10 chapters later? Why? Well, the first reason is this, fear. They felt comfortable where they were. They felt safe. They knew that. They knew Jerusalem. They lived there. They knew the temple. It was traditional. It was their place. It was their little safe cocoon. There is something in all of us that feels an internal tension between the excitement of an adventure and the fear of an adventure. Something inside of us wants adventure. By the thumbprint of the creator, God put an appetite for adventure in us. All of us. We may have bludgeoned it into insensibility because of fear, but it's there deep, deep down inside. I can prove it to you. Anybody here not see it on television or in a video or something? Anybody here ever actually do bungee jumping? Will you raise your hand? Just if you've ever actually done bungee jumping, it looks like about 10 or 12 people. Well, let me just say this to you. My mama didn't raise no fool. <laughs> Climb up on a tall tower, let a stranger tie a rope around your ankles and pay him to throw you off. What's up with that? The only thing I can think of is the adrenaline surge that must be yours when you watch the ground rushing up at you and you're praying to God Almighty that they measured that rope right. <laughs> I can bring it down to a little more basic level. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Why do we go to scary movies? What is that about? Take our popcorn and our Coke and go sit in a dark theater and say, nah, come on, scare the liver out of me. Why? Because we get a little taste of a vicarious adventure, but we know nothing really bad is going to happen to us. The lion roars on the screen, but he's not coming out and eat us. But we like that. I believe that there is something in us that longs for adventure, but there is also something in us that wants to cling to the nice, safe cocoon. We just don't want to be pushed out. We want to stay in Jerusalem, whatever our Jerusalem is. We want to stay in the temple, whatever part of our life we've memorialized. We want to cling to the nice, safe porch, no matter how stridently we hear the Holy Spirit saying, get off the porch. But each adventure is different. 
Every one of us has a different adventure. God says to somebody, now I want you to go next door to your next door neighbor, the people that are making you crazy, whose teenager keeps riding his motorcycle across your front lawn, and you think they probably are running a crack house in there. I know you hate them and you wish they were gone, but I want you to go next door and invite them to church with you and tell them that Jesus loves them. And you say, Lord, here am I. Send him. Because they're, they're, we feel the risk. We, we can sense they might do something horrible. Reject us. Ooh. We, we have lived in a pretty tidy little cocoon in American Christianity. I, I, I'm going to say to you, I think, it's been, I think it's been pretty easy to be a Christian in America. And I, I have a... I have something I want to say to you this morning, but I don't want you to hear it. I'm neither a prophet nor the child of a prophet. So this is not a prophecy. If you hear it that way, you're not listening. But I am, however, an observer of human history. And what I sense in myself is that the darkness is descending. I think it may very well get darker and darker before the sun comes up. I think it may get more and more challenging, more and more difficult to be a Christian in America. I think there may be more and more punitive laws passed, more and more situations and circumstances where it is not a nice, easy, safe cocoon to be an American Christian. And I am not 100% sure that's the bad part. I think it may drive nice, safe, cozy Christians into the situation where they get out on the adventure, where God says, now you wouldn't move. I will move you. Get off the porch. The problem is we don't want to let go of that nice, safe cocoon. I, I, I do. I'm not any different. When I was uh, the president of Southeastern University in Lakeland, Florida, I've been there 10 years. We had 10 and a half years. We had a fantastic ride. We built $65 million worth of buildings. We went from college status to university status. We went from less than 1,000 students to uh, more than 3,500 students. It was just growing, going, and blowing. At the end of 10 and a half years, I was like Rush Limbaugh. I could run that university with half my brain tied behind my back. It was just cozy, easy, just flowing. At that time, right at that moment, if you'll remember, I'm sure you do, there was a terrible scandal at Oral Roberts University. The faculty sued the president. The president resigned and he left. And then there was all this financial collapse and all the rest of it. A headhunter, um, an executive search firm, called me and they said, the president at ORU has resigned and the board would like us to approach you about being the president. I said, no. <laughs> no. I said, I will not. He kept calling, calling, calling. Once he called me in a hotel in Jerusalem. I said, son, I don't know what time it is where you are. But I said, I'm in Jerusalem. And we just got tenser and tenser with each other. Finally, I said to him, don't call me again. Do not call me. And I said, I want you to take note of this. I will never, ever, ever be the president of Oral Roberts University. How old are you, son? 21. Look right up here at me. I'm going to help you. I don't know what your theology is. Here's mine. God writes down everything that you say. And before you die, he will feed it to you. Four months later, I was the president at Oral Roberts University. <laughs> but it was not an easy decision. It had been wrecked. It was in deep financial trouble. The buildings needed repairing. The enrollment had collapsed. And I was safe. I, the porch at Southeastern was wonderful. Nobody was mad at me. Everything was great. One night, after all these calls kept going on, my wife... Allison and I were sitting by the fireplace one night and she said, are you beginning to worry that this Oral Roberts thing is from God? And I said, I sure am. I am concerned about it. And she said, what would keep us 
If this is God, what would keep us from obeying? I said, it's just so easy here. My comfort zone is about the size of Wyoming. And then I said, I just don't want my comfort zone to dictate my destiny. God can give you a comfort zone if that's all you want. But if you want to get out on the cutting edge of the adventure, he says, come out further, come up higher, come closer. Let's go out off this porch. You can catch little tiny fish in the surf, but you want to catch big fish, come out further. And of course, it's scary. I, all, these other, all these other guys, they give their testimonies. They're so bold. They're brave. I'm coming. I, I'm saying, I'm coming, God. Ooh, 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 ooh. Ooh. See my face. But that's okay. Don't you see? That's okay. God knows exactly who we are. Now, that's the first reason that we are reluctant to obey God in getting off the porch is because simply because the porch is safe and nice and, and it's, our, it's our porch. Here's the funny thing. Even if it's difficult, even if it's a painful porch, it's our painful porch. We're used to, we can get used to a difficult, painful porch. So we, we just don't want to try something different. It may even look good, but we're, it's just our porch. So that's the first reason. The second reason is worse. The people at Jerusalem, the Jewish believers at Jerusalem, didn't want to go elsewhere because the Jews were all in Israel. They didn't want to go to the Gentiles. They didn't want to be elsewhere. They didn't want to be among them. They weren't Jewish. They didn't think Jewish. They didn't worship Jewish. They just didn't want to be among them. You know, the, the tribalism between the Jews and the Samaritans, and the Samaritans were at least, they were cousins of the Jews. It was not like they were Romans or Greeks or something. They were cousins of the Jews and they were there geographically with them in, intermingled. But there was this tribalism. We just don't want to be with their kind. I, I believe that it is one of Satan's most dem, demonic strategies to hinder the gospel and to divide us from one another to set us up in tribes. All kinds of tribes, not just racial tribes, but cultural tribes, political tribes. And that is the hallmark of the 21st century, of particularly this time right now. We are divided in tribes and we all peer at each other from our porch. Don't come on my porch. Oh, I don't want you on my porch. We're in all kinds of tribes. We get, look at this pandemic. We got tribes out of it. We divided up into the Mascovites. against the Magasites. And that vote, you don't vote in my tribe. You don't wear the, you don't have this tribe. You don't have that tribe. Racial tribes. Now listen to Dr. Mark. Some of you may not like this, but I ain't running for nothing in Georgia. <laughs> if your fundamental self-identity arises from anything, anything, politics, culture, national frontier, race, if your self-identity arises from anything that supersedes your identity in Christ, it's a sin. It is satanic to separate us up into tribes, to, to keep us afraid of one another. We project onto other people in other tribes. They hate me. They don't like me. If I, if I deal with that tribe, no tell them what they'll do. It separates us up. It makes us afraid. It makes us resistant. We can't even talk to the people next door about Jesus because we're not sure what tribe they're in. The, the current pandemic, COVID, younger people forget. That's not the first time we've ever dealt with anything like this. But back in the late 70s and the 80s, the frightening, terrifying pandemic, nobody knew what it meant, was AIDS. And the AIDS seemed to be rising in certain lifestyles, the gay community and all that. We weren't sure what that meant. It was, it was terrifying. And 
I was in my office. I pastored a mega church in Orlando and that time in the early 1980s. Uh, let's see, the late 1980s. And hospital called me and said, Dr. Utland, we have a patient here. It's been very difficult to deal with and resistant and angry. And we, did, we, we can't, we've called several pastors. We can't get a pastor to come visit with him. Would you come? And I said, look, I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night. Is, is he in the AIDS ward? They said, yes, he's dying. He's, he's dying with AIDS. I said, I'll be there in an hour. Went down to the hospital and you know, nobody knew how to handle it all. Didn't know how you could contract it. They put you in a suit and shoes and gloves and a mask and the whole deal. I went in this room. It was a teenage boy, 19 year old boy lying up in the bed in a pink nightgown holding a teddy bear. When I walked in the room, I said, I'm Mark Rutland. I'm the pastor of Calvary Church. And he just went like that. He said, I guess you've come to tell me Jesus hates queers. I said, no, I've come to tell you Jesus loves queers. He said, what? He said, well, I never thought I'd hear a preacher say that. I said, well, maybe you don't know enough preachers. I said, can we talk? He said, I would like to. I pulled a chair up by the bed. We talked probably an hour, just talked. The conversation drifted to Jesus, his goodness, his love, his compassion. And then finally he began to tell me about his life. He said that since the time he was 14 until he was 19, he had hundreds of older adult male partners. He said, I don't even know the number and I don't know their names and I'm dying with what they gave me. He was angry and hurt. We began to talk about forgiveness and love and grace. And finally I asked him, would you like to receive Christ as your savior? And he said, will, will he take me? The issue is not me receiving him. Will he receive me? Will he take me? I said, absolutely. We prayed together. He received Christ as his savior. We talked more. We began to talk about life and eternity. And finally, I asked him, I said, look, are you clear on where you are physically? Has this hospital made it clear to you? He said, do you mean, do I know I'm dying? I said, yes. He said, I'll never get out of this bed. He said, I know I'm dying. I said, let's talk about what comes next. And die in this bed. What happens after this bed? We just begin to talk about heaven, how beautiful it would be, how wonderful, his healing, his new body, all of that. And finally, he said, can that be mine? I said, you've accepted Christ as your savior. It will be yours. You will go to sleep in this bed and wake up in glory. He looked at me and he said, get a nurse, get a nurse. And I thought he meant he was dying. I said, are you okay? He said, get a nurse. I said, what's the matter? He said, well, look at me. I don't want to die in a pink nightgown. <laughs> do you see, do you see that's actually a sanctification statement. You see that, right? You get saved as you are. Sanctification doesn't change what happened in your past. Sanctification is the surrendering of everything that you have now. All he had was a pink nightgown and he changed it. That's sanctification. Let me tell you something else. This, this can be hard for people, traditional evangelicals. It can be hard for them. That boy lived a monstrous, sinful life. He got saved hours before he died and he woke up in heaven with Jesus. If that tribe, if all the things that go with that tribe separate us from that tribe, how will we ever penetrate that? How can we ever get there? How can we talk to our next door neighbor if they look different, talk different, worship differently, or don't worship at all? You can hear that faint whisper, get off the porch. So what's the third reason? The first reason is fear of the adventure. The second reason is out and out tribalism. We just don't want to be with them. What's the third reason? It is we doubt God for the outcome. We're not sure what will happen. What we, if God would say to us, go next door to the crack house next door, 
witness to them. They're all going to fall on the floor and get saved. They'll be baptized in the Holy Ghost. You'll report it to Jensen Franklin. He's going to bring you up on the platform. You'll give a testimony. Next week, you'll be on the 700 Club, and your book's going to sell in the hundreds of thousands. We would say, I'm ready. The problem is, God says, go and do what I'm telling you to do. And you say, God, yeah, but what's going to come of it? What's the outcome? What's going to come of it? What's the result? And God says, I'm not discussing this with you. <laughs> See, we, we want to obey God like our teenagers obey us. Go clean up your room. Okay. <laughs> I'm going but I want you to know you've ruined my life. <laughs> so here's this great revival. The whole city gets saved. The whole city gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the apostles, the, the, the apostles Peter and John, the next verse says, and they went back to Jerusalem. <laughs> but the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. It was Philip that punctured that tribal balloon. And the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip and said, Now go down the road from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. <laughs> I don't want to be so blasphemous as to project my carnality onto the saints of the New Testament. But am I the only one? God gives you an entire city. You have a a miracle of signs and wonders and salvations and water baptism and baptism of the Holy Ghost, a Pentecost, stomp down Holy Ghost Pentecostal revival, authenticated and endorsed by apostolic presence. I know what I would say. Okay, Lord, that takes care of some area. Where now? How about Athens? What about Rome? Rome, God, I'd like to just suggest Rome. Let's get Caesar saved. It'll change the course of human history. Where do you want me to go now? And God says, down the desert road into Gaza. Do you see what that means? It means that God's geography is not the same as yours. With God, the shortest distance between any two points is not necessarily a straight line. What you think is that God will lead you from city to bigger city to biggest city. And God says, I'll give you a revival. Great. Now what? A desert. And God doesn't make it easy for him. God doesn't tell him the outcome. God doesn't say, if you'll go down the road to the desert, you're going to have a miracle. It's going to be recorded in the New Testament someday. Something great is going to happen. He just says, go down the road from Jerusalem to Gaza and God makes it clear, which is desert. And Philip obeys. As he is walking down the road, an Ethiopian, a eunuch, comes in his chariot on the way home from Jerusalem back to Ethiopia. He's the chief financial officer for Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, Candace, however you say it, the, the queen of Ethiopia. He's riding along, and the Spirit of the Lord says to Philip, Approach this chariot. And the next verse is instrumental in understanding Philip. It says, and he ran to the chariot. If we obey God reluctantly, like our teenagers obey us, God will take that. He'll take and use whatever we give him. But what he wants is for us to hear his slightest, faintest whisper and run to obey. Philip runs to the chariot and he climbs up in the chariot with this Ethiopian and he says, what are you reading? He says, the book of Isaiah, but I don't understand it. I don't know what to say. And it says, and beginning where he was, Philip began to talk to him about Jesus. You see what it is? This is a different tribe, a different race, a different nation. And Philip begins where he is. We can't ask everybody to get to where we are before we can talk about Jesus. It says, and beginning where he was, he talked to him about Jesus. After a while, the Ethiopian trusted in Christ for his savior. 
He says, can I be baptized? There's some water right there. Can I be baptized? Philip says, if you've believed on the Lord Jesus for your, as your savior, you can be baptized. He says, let's do it. They climb down from the chariot, get out in the little lake or pond or whatever it is, and Philip baptizes him. When they come out of the water, Philip is translated away, immediately just taken, and they said he is immediately found on a street corner in Azotus preaching. <laughs> I have a biblical and theological question that I have asked of some of the greatest scholars in the world, and they've never been able to answer it for me. And here it is. When he landed in Azotus, was he still wet? <laughs> I mean, does translation dry you out? He came straight up out of a lake. He's standing on a street corner preaching. I can just imagine people walking by saying, we are really interested in what you're saying, but what happened to you? What does it all mean? It means that the miracle was at the end of a desert road. The miracle was at the end. God says, get off the porch. He takes him to Samaria, then down a desert road. He doesn't tell you what's going to be the result. He just says, keep pressing out, keep going further. The miracle of what God wants to do in your life and do through you in the lives of others is further down. God doesn't have to explain it to you. God is God and he expects to be obeyed and he expects us to run to the chariot. The bottom line of all this is this. What about you? What about you? I want you to notice in this story, Peter and John are not the heroes of this story. They're the apostles. When Philip is at Samaria, they're in Jerusalem. They follow him to Samaria. And then as soon as the revival sort of tables out, what do they do? They go back to Jerusalem. It is Philip who paves the way. It is Philip that is out on the edge. It's Philip that refuses to be hindered by tribalism. It's Philip that doesn't worry about the results. It's Philip that lives a life of obedience. And he was not ordained to be an evangelist. He was ordained to wait tables. He was a steward. He was a deacon whom God used. What does that mean? That means there is no Christian under the sound of my voice in this room or in any of our campuses or online who is, who is unable for God to use you. You just as you are. In the parking lot of a convenience store, when you're checking out of the grocery store and the, the clerk across the counter from you is rude to you. See, getting all mad. Why don't you say to her, I can tell you've had a bad day and I, I hate it for you. And I just want you to know two things. Jesus loves you. And when I get out to my car in the parking lot, I'm not offended with you. I understand you're struggling. When I get out to my car, I'm going to pray for you. But I want you to know Jesus loves you and God knows everything you're going through. We, we won't step out. We won't get out of our own little comfortable cocoon. We won't look past her tribe. We won't look past her, the color of her skin or the political button she wears to her lapel. We've got to get past all that stuff and get out, be willing to get out on the cutting edge, that desert road, because that's where the miracle is. And God has something for every single one of you. I'm telling you, even on the way home from church today, somebody somewhere that doesn't look like they ought to be in your life. And God will say, get off the porch. Let's pray. All over the house, if you bow your heads and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will empower us this morning. That somehow you will speak and brush aside every barrier to, communic to communication. That we may hear from you. Summon us up higher. Summon us out further, in deeper. Speak to us. Now, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm going to only ask you two questions. I want you to respond by raising your hand. I'm opening my eyes. Everybody else's eyes are closed. If you'll just pause where you are, with your eyes closed. If you would say, Dr. Mark, will you pray for me? I have been too much of a porch-sitting Christian. I want God to push me out further. I want to obey God. I want to go out deeper. 
I'm ready to get off the porch. Will you please pray for me that God will take me out? Use even the likes of me. And don't raise your hand if you don't mean it because it's a dangerous prayer. God could, have, God could answer your prayer. Don't ask him to take you out deeper if you're only gonna stay in the shallow water. But if you would say, I want God to use me, even me, then lift your hand up where you are and I wanna pray for you. Wow, 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 so many, so many. I'm so impressed. I'm so proud of you. Heavenly Father, you see our hands. Mine are raised, God. I'm asking you, God, that you will tear us loose from all of those things that hold us back Forgive us of our tribalism and our fear of others. Oh God, take us where we're uncomfortable. Lead us to people that need to hear about you. Even us, God, we may be trembling and fearful, God. Help us to get off the porch, God. Help us, Lord. We believe you for it. Give us the boldness of the line of the tribe of Judah. And we believe you that the results, the outcomes are all yours. It's all yours. Lead us to a great city or to a lonely desert. It's all the same to us. Now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed still, if you'll take your hands down. Now here's the second question. It's so simple. It's the question I ask that boy in that hospital. I'm not asking if you're a churchgoer. God can make churchgoers out of the pews you sit on. I'm asking if you were to die right this minute, this morning where you sit. If you were to die this morning, are you 100% sure you'd be in heaven? If you, were to, if you were to die right now, do you have the assurance of your salvation? I'm not asking if you lived a sinful life like that boy or that you think you're the worst person in the county. I'm asking one simple question. If you were to die right now, are you sure you'd be in heaven? If you're not sure, then I want you to raise your hand up where you are so I can see it and I wanna pray for you. Just hold your hand up high. Just say, I'm just, I'm just not sure. Yes, yes, there's five or six there, two little children right there. Parents never keep a child from praying. Good, there's another, two more there. Raise your hand up, four or five over here. If you're on the risers, will you wave your hand so I can see you? It's quite a distance back there. Yes, I see you way up there, all the way on the back row of the risers. Yes, nearly to the front row of the main floor. Raise your hand, lift it up high. Anyone else? Say, I'm not confessing some monstrous sin. I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure. Yes, way over there, way up there on the rise. There's so many, so many, so many, so many. Now I'm going to pray. I want you to stay right where you are. Heavenly Father, you see these hands. You know their hearts. You know their middle names. I'm asking God that everything of pride or fear or religion would be struck away from them and that they would be free to respond to your grace and to your love and your invitation. I believe you for this, God. I thank you for it in advance. Now, when I say amen to this prayer, in just a moment, we're gonna stand and begin to sing. People all over the auditorium worshiping God, the band playing, the musicians singing, people around you singing, but not you. You raised your hand. The moment we stand, you're gonna to begin to press your way to the aisle. You're gonna step out and come straight to me. If there's someone between you and the aisle, just turn to them and say, let me out. They may need to come too. If you're in the risers, it's gonna be quite a hike. You need to start immediately and come here. Your friends and your family will wait for you. I want you to, the minute I say amen to this prayer, we're gonna stand and make your first move as you stand. Your first move is straight to the aisle. Why would you hesitate now when it's the Lord of grace and mercy who promises you heaven? In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Let's stand and you come as we sing. Come right now. Come right now.
Praise God. Isn't this wonderful? Thank God Almighty. Thank God. Praise God. Praise God. Now listen to me. Look right up here and listen to me. You have been very bold to walk up here. I'm so proud of you. It took a lot to walk in front of this big house full of people and walk all the way up here. Some of you from the very back row of the risers. I'm so proud of you. Now I'm going to lead you in a prayer. We're going to pray the prayer of faith together and Christ is going to come into your life into your marriage, into your future. And from this moment on, He changes everything. And then when you die, you have the absolute assurance that death is not the end for you. You're going to wake up in the presence of Christ. Amen? Now, let's all, let's all pray the prayer together. Put your faith with theirs. Put your faith with theirs. We'll pray it together. Now listen, you've been very brave and bold to walk up here, okay? Now, don't pray this prayer like a sissy. Open your mouth and pray it out. Pray it with some faith. Are you ready? All right. You ready, sport? All right. Let's pray. Pray it right out loud. Pray it with me. Heavenly Father, I know that I've sinned. And if I were to die now, I deserve to go to hell. But I believe Jesus died in my place. He took my hell so I don't ever have to go there. He took my death so that I might live. He became my sin that I might become righteousness. I give you my life, everything I am, all that I have from this moment on, I trust in the blood of Jesus and I will live for him. And when I die, I know, pray it out loud, I know I will be in heaven with you. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, magnify the Lord. Praise His holy name. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Now I want you to stay. I want you to stay right where you are. Stay right where you are for just a couple of minutes. Look up here at me. I'm going to make an announcement to you, and I have the authority to make this announcement. Not in the name of Free Chapel, not in the name of any denomination, in the authority of the New Testament. Look right up here. Your sins are forgiven. Everything, your sins, washed away. Everything you've ever done, said, thought, your sins, which were many, are all washed away. Amen? 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 If you were to die right now, where would you go? Heaven. What about you, sport? Heaven. What about you? How old are you? Nine. Praise God. How, how old are you, madam? Quanto años tiene? How old are you? 57? Yes. If it's good at nine, it's good at 57. Amen. Amen. Now I want you to stay where you are. There are some people that are going to talk with you, give you some information, just pray with you before you leave. Your friends and your family will wait for you. Now let me make a couple of very important announcements before you leave. If you'll just stay with me for a moment. As many of you know, we are absolutely seeing a miracle here at Free Chapel like never before. A certain family pledged to give the church $4 million if we as a church body would match $4 million over and above last year's giving. So I have a very important announcement to make. This morning, we are at $3.9 million. Praise God. Now you're so generous and as you leave, there are many ways that you can give. I know that you will give. I urge you to give generously, make a special offering. If you would like to just rip out your checkbook and write a check for $100,000, it's done. And listen, this family that made this pledge, they're worth it. Uh, let, let's, let's hurt them just as bad as we possibly can. Don't let them off the hook even one penny short of four million, amen? They're good for it. Second announcement is even more important. Next Sunday morning, Jensen Franklin himself will be back here. Amen? It hurts me that some of you apologize so enthusiastically. Now will you look right up here and receive a benediction? Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, 
to stand you before his presence without fault and with unspeakable joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before time ever began, right now and throughout all the ages to come. When the battle's over, we'll all wear a crown. God bless you, everybody. God bless. Welcome back, and what an amazing morning we just had here at Free Chapel with Dr. Rutten. Uh, listen, if you just accepted Jesus into your heart and responded to him and invited him into your heart and into your life, whether it's the first time or you're coming back to him, we want to congratulate yes. you. That is the best decision you could ever make in your whole life. We take it seriously here. We want to um, celebrate you. We want to connect with you, see if we can give any resources to you or come alongside in that journey. So would you please do me a favor, text the word yes to 510-510, the number 510-510. Just text the word yes, and that gives us the opportunity to connect with you and, um, and pray with you and yeah. be there with you in this journey. We yeah. don't want you to feel like you're alone in this or you don't know what to do or where to go from here. We wanna come alongside you in this uh, journey you are on. And also, if you just want prayer, whether or not you just gave your life to God or not, and you just want somebody to pray with you, you know, prayer changes things. Absolutely. It's changed so much in my Absolutely. life when I just finally decide to submit my cares and cast my worries and anxieties onto the yeah. Lord. And if I have someone to come alongside with me and agree with me and, and submitting those requests to Jesus, it makes a world of yeah. difference. So we want to pray with you as well. You just text the word pray to that same number, 510-510. We have a team of people waiting to pray with you, wanting to come alongside you. What an amazing morning again that we've had with Dr. Rutland. He just has a way always when he <laughs> delivers his message. I feel like I'm laughing, yes. I'm having a good time, but I'm getting slapped with conviction the yes. whole time. I'm like, oh yes. my gosh, that hurts so bad, <laughs> but in a good way. I need to hear that. And I just want to encourage you again, you know, when he was talking about sanctification, sanctification doesn't require you to change anything in your past. Hallelujah for that. I'm, I know I, I can't amen. change my past amen, no matter sister. how much I wanted to. But it, it just, yield, you yield everything in your present and in your future over to God's hands. So whatever you have today, whether it's a mess, give it to God. He'll make it a masterpiece. It's so beautiful that he just, he'll meet us right where we're at. We don't have to climb our way back to holiness or back to Jesus. So I just want to encourage you again with that amazing word this morning. Yeah, and I loved when he talked about getting off the porch. I was yes, just talking to Abby so this good. morning about, it's been three mm -hmm. years since I've been on a mission trip. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was kind of the Lord just probing me totally. and saying, Get off the porch. It's, it's time, time to get out of your mm -hmm. comfort zone and go. Something right. else is um, God's geography is not your geography, nor yeah. is His economy your economy. And Amen. so He can do so much Preach more with that. So um, get off the porch if that's you, if you've been waiting. <laughs> so good. Hop on off that porch. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, we also want to encourage you uh, to go on this Israel, the Experience Israel trip yes. with Pastor Franklin and his wife, Sharice. Mm -hmm. It's going to be an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. You can go online and sign up for that soon. It's this December, December 1st through 5th, I yeah. believe. Yeah. Maybe 1st through 10th. It's online, freechapel.org. <laughs> You're invited. Hey, we also want to make sure that you invite somebody with you next yes. Sunday. Come watch. Um, Pastor mm -hmm. Franklin's going to be back in the house. We're excited to have him home. Yes. And um, just join. ask somebody to join you. Absolutely. But we're going to pray you yep. out, um, pray over your week. And um, mm -hmm. and then we'll let you go. Yes. Father God, we just thank you so much for today. God, we thank you for the opportunity, God, to sit um, in your presence, Jesus. We just thank you for meeting us in, in this place, Father. Yeah. God, I pray for every individual watching, Jesus, Father God, that they would have been touched by this message that you had that you had put on Dr. Rutland's heart, Father. God, I pray over their weeks, Jesus. Father, mm -hmm. God, maybe there's some, something that they're sitting on their porch about, Jesus, and I just pray, God, that you would probe them. God, that you would allow them to get out of their comfort zone, Jesus, that you would that you would take them into the week, God, with great expectation that you're gonna do something great. Mm -hmm. Father God, that you're gonna allow them to take on things, Father, that they didn't ever think that they would see coming, Jesus. But we just, we love you, God. We thank you and we are expectant in what you're gonna do. God, we love yes. this online campus, Jesus. We love this family, God, and we just pray that you would go before them. God, we thank you for who you are, all that you do, all that you're going to do. Mm -hmm. In your name we pray. Thank you, Amen. Thank you guys for all of you who generously give faithfully and sow into this ministry week in and week out. We are trying to match that fund of four million. We're almost there, 3.9. I have no doubt in my mind. Right, my math We're, great. Yes, you're right. We'll you get there. you got in your pocket, so just write the check. <laughs> we are fertile in soil faith. here at Free Chapel. Yes. So we love y'all. We'll see you next week. Have an amazing week. Y'all be blessed. See ya. Bye.